before Mitch comes to uh, preach, uh, we'll just read 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're doing a series on 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read the whole of chapter 3 now. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory so that the Israelites couldn't look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is... There is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let's just pray for Mitch as he comes. Lord, we thank you for our brother Mitch, and we pray that you would anoint him as he comes to bring your word, and we pray that every word he speaks would fall on our hearts and would uh, produce life-changing results. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Grace. Uh, well, if I haven't met you, um, my name's Mitch, and I've been a part of River Life for, for almost a year now, and it's, uh, it's my privilege to be able to open God's Word with you today. Uh, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as Grace just read out. So if you have a Bible with you, or if you have it on your phone, uh, it'd be great if you keep that open, as we're going to work our way through that together. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy in life is, is reading a good book. Whether it's fiction or non-fiction, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I just enjoy reading. Uh, and over the last few years, I've, I've come to really love reading autobiographies in particular, the, the stories of real people's lives. And over the Christmas break, uh, I read this book called Will, which is Will Smith's autobiography. Uh, and I found it really fascinating uh, hearing some of his story about going from a, a kid that was stacking bags of ice with his father to one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. Uh, now, I'm, I've started a new book, a new autobiography. It's called A Promised Land. It's uh, Barack Obama's, uh, it's his autobiography. And I think it's a, a really amazing insight into to what it was like for him to be the president of the United States. And so I'm really enjoying that. I can recommend that highly. Um, my favorite one from last year was, was this one. It was uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's biography, so a, a little different because he, he didn't write it. But I think my favorite parts of it 
were, were the letters that were included that he wrote himself. You could just almost hear his thoughts coming directly to you off the pages. And as I was, was walking along this week uh, listening to Obama's autobiography, I should have said that, it's cheating a little, but I'm listening to his one as an, an audio book, so judge me if you want. Um, but I was, I was walking along and thinking about, why, why do I enjoy these so much? Like, what is it that's so captivating? And the reason that I landed on was this. It's, it's almost like reading a, a really long letter that is addressed directly to you because it's, it's addressed in first person from the person who's writing it. It's a long letter addressed straight to you. It's, it's almost like you're, you're getting to know them on a personal level. Now, I don't think I'll ever have the chance to meet Will Smith or President Obama, and until I reach heaven, I don't have a chance of meeting Bonhoeffer. But when you read something that they've written in a book, it almost feels like they're speaking straight to you. You get personal insight into their lives. You see, you see what motivates them. You see what their life is like. You see the things that matter to them. And in this passage that we're looking at today, Paul says that whether you realize it or not, your life is like a long letter as well. He says, you have an autobiography that is being read by other people right now. And it will keep being read by other people into the future as well. In fact, for as long as you live. He says, you are a letter. And it's been read all of the time. It's not words on a page, though, that people are reading. It's, it's our very lives that are being read. Our actions, the way that we love and care for people, the words that we speak, even the moments that other people see that we're not so proud of. They're the things that make up the letter that Paul says other people will read. Not a physical book, but a person. You. You. Now, I know that's a slightly abstract thought, so I wanted to, to phrase it a little more as a question to try and clarify for, uh, that for us and make it a little more concrete. But when people look at your life, what would stand out to them about you? Paul is basically asking that question in a slightly different way, saying, when people read the letter that is your life, what are they reading? What are they reading about you? What do they see matters most? What do they think is at the center of your life? And in 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now, whenever it is that it is all said and done for you and you meet God face to face, what will the letter of your life have said to others between now and then? That might be hard for you to think about. You know, maybe you're not sure what it says. Maybe you don't want to think about it. Maybe the metaphor I'm using just hasn't really worked that well. But whatever you're thinking or feeling right now, I, I want us to all have this question in our mind as we read through the passage today, because I think it's the question that Paul answers as we go through. The, the question's this, what do people read when they open the letter that is your life? What, what do people read as they open up that letter about your life? What do they see? What are the words that are written down about you? In this passage, 2 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul shows us that other people should read two really important things when they read that letter that is your life. Let's have a look at them together. The, the first one is, Paul says, it should be a letter that is about Christ. It should be a letter about Christ. So have a look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, it'll come up on the screen here as well for those who need that. And we'll read it and then think about what that means for us. Paul says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You see this letter idea that Paul in, uh, introduces straight away. But he also makes a, an allusion here to some people. And it feels a little bit sassy. Uh, have a look again. It says, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? But what he's doing here is he's intentionally pointing out another group of people that have arrived in Corinth. He's not specific about who they are or what their names are. 
But it seems that they've arrived with these letters of recommendation in their hand from people in some kind of position of authority and handed it over almost as a, a sign that their ministry is valid. It's their way of proving that they have authority to minister to people. And then when they get there and they do that, they start criticizing Paul. They're criticizing his ministry and whether it's even valid. It's like someone walking into River Life one day, pulling out a letter from a, a well-known Christian in a different country that says, I support this person. And then that person who's arrived here wanting to get up into the pulpit and preach and saying that they have more authority to do so than Nick or Grace because of a letter. Now, that seems kind of crazy for us to think about, and obviously that wouldn't work here, but in the first century, a letter actually held a lot of authority. In a world without email and telephones and checking references for a job, I know it's hard to imagine, but in those kind of times, holding a letter from a person in power, it actually went a really long way. It held a lot of weight. So when this happens, Paul, he's got a little bit of a, a dilemma that he needs to work through. What, what's his authority for doing ministry compared to these people with their fancy letters? Well, Paul then addresses that in verses 2 and 3. Let's, let's read it together. He says, You yourselves are our letter, the Corinthian people, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone like the law was, but on tablets of human hearts. The Corinthians, they would have been shocked to hear this. They hear that they're the letters of recommendation that Paul has. He doesn't point to important people or a special status that he holds or even a really great CV. He points to people in front of him. They're his claim to true and genuine ministry. He's saying there was no Christian church before I arrived, and now look at you. You know and you love Jesus. He's saying the proof is in the fruit, and the fruit is that the Corinthian church has now become a letter from Christ to the watching world around them. Paul's opponents, on the one hand, they base their claims on letters of recommendation from important people. But Paul, he does the opposite. Paul's letter of recommendation is the people themselves. It's their lives. And I think this is really important for us to understand because that's the measure of those that we should look to in ministry. It's not a degree or a title. It's not a recommendation from a well-known individual. But it's whether they're living letters, walking around and testifying to living a life changed by Jesus, and whether other people have been impacted by their, their ministry. Paul is saying what value does a letter written on ink and paper have compared to a letter carved by the Spirit in the heart of people? I think for us here at River Life, this is a really important message for us in this season as well. As we look for and as we pray about a new senior pastor, you know, the quality that God desires is, is not an impressive CV or references but a ministry history showing that the person has been faithful in pointing people to Christ and seeing lives transformed by him in the process. I find what Paul's saying here quite interesting for another reason too. He's a man being criticized, but he seems incredibly sure about this. He doesn't feel that threatened. And so I think it's important for us to ask, why is he so confident about this? Why is he so confident? Well, Paul goes on and he tells us where his confidence comes from. On the next slide, we'll see verses 4 through to 6. Paul writes, Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. 
He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul's confidence, it comes from Christ and not from himself. He's not arrogant. He's just confident about what Christ is doing. And his competence, which means his ability to do any of these things, it comes from God by the Spirit and and not just from his own strength. He he has this this certainty about him because of Christ and, and not just his own capabilities. To to summarize what he's been saying in these first six verses, I've uh, just put a few uh, sentences of that on one slide uh, for us to see together. Here's the three really key things that he says. You show that you are a letter from Christ, in verse 3. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, in verse 4. And then in verse 5, our competence comes from God. You see, if it wasn't clear already, Paul's point is this. The other people who've arrived have letters about themselves and how good they are, but for the Corinthians and for Paul, they're a letter from Christ, a letter about Christ. They have confidence in Christ, and they have competence that comes from God. It is all about Jesus, not themselves. And it's the same for us today. See, this letter here to the Corinthian church, it's not just about Paul and it's not just about the Corinthians. It should be an encouragement to us as well. We are letters to be read by the world. I think we live in a world today that says your accomplishments matter. Your status and your perception from other people, that's what matters. Where your job title, your bank account your possessions, they all say something about your worth and your value. We live in a society where what you can point to and say, this is what I've done, this is who I am, that's what determines the mark that you leave on this world. But you know what? The mark of a Christian, it's none of those things. It's having a life that can be seen by everyone like a letter that can be read by all people that shows them Jesus in every moment. That is what Paul says is the kind of life that the Spirit gives. About eight years ago, when when my wife Susan and I were dating, I went on a holiday uh, over here to to Europe and to the US for for about six weeks with my family. Uh, We flew from Sydney and uh, I knew that I was going to miss Sue's. And so I decided that for all 42 days that I was away, I'd have a letter for her to open, reminding her that you know I loved her or that I cared for her or to try and encourage her. Some of them had, had Bible verses on them and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it ended up being the, the peak of my romantic gestures, but a few months later we're engaged, so somehow you know I think it worked. Um, But I wanted her to know that I really cared for her. I wanted her to know that I loved her and how I I felt about her. And so I made sure all of them had a date on it. They they knew, uh, Suze knew exactly which day she was meant to open all 42 of them on. There wasn't a single day without a letter signed to it to open. And and I think in a lot of ways, Paul is saying that as Christians, that's what our life is meant to be like as well where we are like a letter to be opened every day by the people in our lives. Where we're meant to be a reminder to everyone that we meet, not just people who we're romantically involved in, uh, involved with. A reminder to them that we love them and that we care for them, that they're valuable, that they have dignity, even in a world that might shun them because they're made in the image of God. You see, when you wake up tomorrow, your your life, it will be read by other people. Not just for the next 42 days, but for every day after that. And Paul says, you don't have to worry about whether you think you're good enough or not. Because you already are a letter from Christ. Your competence, it doesn't come from yourself. It comes from knowing Jesus. Jesus. 
You're made competent by the Spirit who gives you life. This is who you are. You're a letter from Jesus. You're a letter for everyone to read. And knowing that this is who we are, it it should shape how we approach people. It should shape how we live our lives. You know, if you're here today and and you're a Christian, please know this. Your life is not defined by what you do, but by Christ who is living in you. Your life doesn't need to be impressive in the ways that our society says it has to be. It is already the most beautiful letter that anyone could ever read because it's about Jesus. Remember that. There's freedom found in that truth and in living into that reality. So, Paul said, firstly, the letters of our lives, that they should be a letter about Christ. But the second thing that Paul wants us to see is that the letter that people read is also a letter sharing our transformation. It's a letter sharing what God has done in our lives. To to help us see why and how this transformation is so important in our lives, uh, Paul compares the old and the new covenants as a way of seeing what has made our transformation through Christ possible. Now, if you're unfamiliar with those, uh, those two terms, the, the old covenant is from before Jesus' time, when, when Israel was living under the law uh, and, and all of the Old Testament commands. And that was how they were made right with God. That's, that's the old covenant. And then we have the new covenant, and that's what Jesus brings in, where he saves us by grace as he lays down his life on the cross. Then he gives us the gift of his spirit, and then transforms us from the inside out. And so what I want us to do just really briefly is to look at how Paul compares and contrasts the old and the new covenant in the next few verses. We'll go through verse by verse and just point out a few differences uh, along the way as we read. So let's, let's start with verses 6 to 8, uh, and we'll have a read of those together. Here's what, here's what Paul writes. He says, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Notice the difference then in verse 7. It says, now if the ministry that brought death, the old covenant, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Paul's saying that the old covenant, well, that that brought death because the standard in the old covenant, it couldn't be reached on our own. We had to be be perfect in obeying all of these laws. That's what he says in verse 7. But did you notice in verse 6, right before it, he says the new covenant that comes through the Spirit, it brings life. He's contrasting them. One brings death one brings life. Then he explains that that Moses, well, Moses needed to veil his face or cover his face to prevent people from seeing its brightness. Uh, According to Paul, the the reason for this is because Moses didn't want them to see that it was was fading away. It was temporary. Whereas by contrast, he says, the glory of the ministry of Christ is that it's permanent. Permanent. It's not temporary and fading. It is permanent and it's far greater. It will never, ever fade. So we've got two uh, points of of difference here. The old covenant brings death and it's temporary. The new covenant, it brings life and it's permanent. Then Paul goes on, verses 9 and 10, and he writes this. He says, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, so he's not just writing off the old covenant. He says, it still had some glory, It was still good. Well, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. So Paul's saying that the the old covenant wasn't completely bad. It served a purpose. It helped people to obey God. But it brought condemnation. It brought condemnation, which that word basically means that you're guilty before God. Whereas the new covenant, it brings righteousness, which means that you're set free. 
It's more glorious because it sets us free by the grace that we're given in Jesus. See, it goes from glory to more glory, from condemnation to righteousness. Can you see what he's doing here? He's, he's contrasting the two and showing why the new covenant is so much better. The last bit that we'll look at is verses 12 to 17. And again, try and follow along and we'll, we'll notice a few differences. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Saying the veil, it represents the insufficiency of the old covenant. It still sits over the minds of people who rely on that. Whereas the new covenant is where Christ lifts the veil to see the true glory of God. In one, we're veiled and unable to see it fully. In the next, we're unveiled and able to see God as we were made to be. Verse 17, it expresses this too. It says the Spirit brings freedom. So instead of being under the law, we're given freedom in Christ. It's this shift from this religious life of just following rules and a move to having a relationship with God through the Spirit. Now, I know that was a really quick summary, and we flew through a bunch of verses. And so here's, um, here's a quick summary of that in one slide, if you want to take a photo or make a note of that. Here's what the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant looks like. Death versus life. Glorious, more glorious. Temporary, permanent. Condemnation, righteousness. Veiled, unveiled. Law, freedom. Religion, relationship through Christ. Here's the point of Paul going to the effort of explaining all of that. He's saying that this change from the old covenant to the new covenant is the same as the transformation that takes place in our lives through Christ. Have a look, the last verse, verse 18. He says, And we all who with unveiled faces, what he's just been talking about, we contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul shows us here that the new covenant brings about the possibility of having our faces unveiled, unobstructed to see God clearly because of what Jesus has done. And then the Holy Spirit comes and fills us and changes us to be like Jesus as well. He transforms us into the likeness of Christ. Not in a physical sense, but, but internally, our character. You know, think the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. He forms us into to people of love who love God and then who go and love others in response. You know, I, th I think that's such a beautiful picture that God does that kind of transformation in your life and in mine and that he says it's also ongoing. You'll notice it says with ever-increasing glory. It's a continual process it's something that will keep happening until we meet God one day in heaven. That's incredible. Your story and my story, they're stories about Christ and how he transforms lives from death to life, from glorious to more glorious, from having a temporary existence here on earth to a permanent home in heaven from being condemned in our sin to being righteous and right with God, from being veiled and just living our own way to being unveiled 
and living with the Spirit inside us, from following laws and religion to having freedom and a relationship with our Father. This is what the letter about your life contains if you follow Jesus. Maybe you've forgotten what God has done in your life. But brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what God has done for you. He is transforming you right now. You know, I believe the best witness we have to the world, it's not, it's not good preaching, it's not good music, it's not the right answers to hard questions, but the best witness we have is our transformed lives. The letters of change that we then go and allow other people to read. I think in the same breath, over the years, one of the the most heartbreaking conversations that I've had and that probably many of you have had as well is when you speak with non-believers who say, why would I be a Christian? Their lives don't look any different to mine. I've heard it from family. I've heard it from friends. I've heard it from people who've walked away from their faith. I've heard it even sometimes from pastors. You know, if you've been sitting here over the last 20 minutes or so and thinking, oh, I don't know how to answer that question. Like, I don't see that God is continuing to transform me or change my life. You can't see how that's continuing to happen right now. I want you to just read verse 18 again, because there's something important to pick up. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image. See, it's it's saying there that God does the transforming, but you'll notice that we, the people with unveiled faces, we're called to contemplate the Lord's glory which means to to behold, to look at him, to gaze upon him. And it's when we do that that God transforms us. And I, I think often the Christians whose lives look no different from the rest of the world, it's because they've stopped contemplating the Lord's glory. They've stopped looking at his face. They've stopped gazing at him and engaging in their relationship with him. See, if you're flat or you're stagnant or your life has been unchanged for a long time, here's your loving application from today. Start contemplating the Lord's glory again. Start meeting with him again. Re-engage in a relationship with him. Transformation does happen when we meet with God. Bible open or in prayer or reflecting upon his goodness and worshiping him. It might be slow, but it's inevitable. So I want to encourage you, begin again. Go back to contemplating God and his goodness in your life. For those of us here who who do know God and, and can see that he's continuing to work in our lives and there is transformation taking place, I've got two quick points of application before we close that I want to share with you. The first is for your friendships with non-believers. I think we need to intentionally be trying to form friendships with people who don't know Jesus, and not just for the point of just trying to talk to them about the gospel and that's it, but where they're close enough to see the difference in our lives. The best evangelistic strategy that Christians have is not inviting people to hear a speaker, it's showing them the letter that is your life, allowing them to read about Christ and your transformation through the way that you love them and interact with them. And I I say this in love and not in judgment, but I think your life is too comfortable if you have no relationships with people who are non-believers. Our lives are made to be on display That's why God is continuing to transform us so that others might come and meet Christ too. So intentionally seek to cultivate relationships with people so that you can do what the Corinthians did and allow yourself 
to be a letter that has been read by them. The second application is for your life with believers. See, our stories, they should be known by each other to encourage and build each other up. What We are letters for one another to read. I think life as a Christian, it's simply too difficult to not be sharing it with fellow believers. This requires vulnerability, though. You can't do it by remaining at a distance from people. It can be messy and it can be daunting, but I think it's the place where we're able to see each other's lives and to read them like a letter properly when we're doing life together. You know, on a really practical level, I've got a challenge for you all today. After the service, why don't you share with people how God is working in your life? whether it's with someone around you or someone that you end up in conversation with, share how God is working in your life or about how you became a Christian. Allow other people to read a little bit of your letter because if we can't do it here, then it probably won't happen anywhere. So so don't be shy. We started with a question, and the question was, what do people read when they open the letter that is your life? But when they open this up, what do they read? And Paul, he's shown us that they should be reading a letter about Christ that shares our transformation with them. For me, my, my story isn't always a nice, neat one. It's not even the one that I'd hoped for. But it's the one that God's given me and continues to weave throughout my life. It's got a lot of transformation to go, but I want it to be open for people to read. Wherever you are in life today and whatever lies before you, you are a letter that is to be read by other people, and it will continue to be read into the future. Is it a letter that's about Christ? Do do people see that? And is it a letter that will keep being written? telling of your ongoing, never-stopping transformation by the Spirit into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory? See, I see that that the answer to that question in many of your lives is a yes. Take heart in what God is doing and what He will do. Keep opening your lives before other people. Keep trusting that God is doing a profound and a beautiful thing inside all of you that the world needs to see because your life is a letter that by God's grace will keep being worth reading. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for your love for us in Christ and that we can have confidence because of what he's done for us that that we can can open up our lives, that we can be a letter that is worth reading by other people. Thank you for the way that you've transformed many of us and that you continue to do that each day. And we pray and ask that you would keep transforming us uh, with ever-increasing glory across the rest of our lives, that we'd never be stagnant or stuck in one spot, but that we'd keep moving in the direction of becoming more and more like Christ. Please help us to to be bold in sharing the hope we have with other people. Help us to to long to be people that allow our lives to be open, to be able to be read. And Lord, we ask that you give us opportunities, even this week, to to do that with other people, to show them uh, the love that you have for them by the way that we we love them in practical, um, big or small ways. So we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.